I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Stegner Center Lecture Series with author Jim Harrison, which is our final such event of this academic year. Tonight we also celebrate, as I think most of you know, the 10th anniversary of the Stegner Center. Ten years ago, along with Paige Stegner, his mother Mary, and other family members, we officially launched this Wallace Stegner Center for Land, Resources, and the Environment at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law. The center was designed as an interdisciplinary forum for promoting educational and research activities related to natural resources and the environment. <clears throat> at the time, I remarked, just as Wallace Stegner comfortably wore the labels of teacher, historian, biographer, writer, novelist, mentor, and citizen of the West, and just as he perceptively conveyed the larger picture of Western settlement and development, the Stegner Center aspires to carry on in that same tradition to develop meaningful and respected conference series, research publications, and educational programs that see the West and beyond with the clarity and insight that Stegner brought to the task during his lifetime. I also promised that in Stegner's tradition and in the best tradition of the Academy, we will think clearly, examine critically, and write truthfully about the natural resource and environmental matters that confront us today. In that vein, the Stegner Center will continue in its efforts to identify and address in a clear-headed fashion and thoughtful manner the issues of the day, always mindful that our ultimate objectives are to educate in an effort to make this a special place for all to live. Now, before hearing from our distinguished author, let me introduce Paige Stegner, who has joined us from Santa Fe for this event. Paige is an accomplished author and an insightful observer of the history, people, and landscape of the American West. His books include Winning the Wild West, the Epic Saga of the American Frontier, 1800 to 1899, Grand Canyon, the Great Abyss, and he edited his father's writings in a book entitled Marking the Sparrows Fall, Wallace Stegner's American West. Before moving to Santa Fe, Page spent 30 years as a professor of American literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I can also vouch that Page is committed to spending as much time as possible on the West's wild rivers and discovering its secret nooks and crannies. We deeply appreciate that he's with us this evening, and we also are very grateful for the support that he and his family have shown for the Stegner Center over the years. Please join me in welcoming Paige, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you very much, Bob. I should, I should uh, point out that my uh, title, Winning the Wild West, was a publisher's title. I wanted to call it Losing the Wild West, but uh, I was vetoed. <laughs> Tonight, in honor of its 10th anniversary, the center brings uh, us another celebrated American writer, a man who wears so many literary hats, it's no hard to know where to begin. Jim Harrison, as I'm sure most of you are already aware, is the author of at least a dozen novels and novella collections. Nine or ten volumes of poetry, innumerable essays on food, travel, nature, fishing, hunting, literature. I don't know how many screenplays you've written, Jim, but I reckon more than a few. I'd rather not think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one included his, his own book, Legends of the Fall. Uh, Harrison has been published widely abroad in many languages, and, and it's worth noting that he is a particular favorite in France, where, according to Terry MacDonald, he's been dubbed the Mozart of the Plains. That's a very cool attribution, I, uh, no matter what it means. I, <laughs> I, I actually have no idea what it means, but it's very cool, Tim. <laughs> Here at home, he's been called everything from raunchy to swaggering to on the short list of American literary masters. His appetite for nonconformity, uh, both personal and professional, 
is a frequent focus of reviewers and critics of his work, to which I think his generic response has been, uh, I don't want to be limited to the main subject matter of white middle class novelists in America, which is nifty guys at loose ends. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure uh, to present a nifty guy whose remarkable productivity and accomplishments over the years suggests, at least to me, a man who has been anything but at loose ends, Jim Harrison. The watch. My father told me early that we have time so everybody doesn't die in the same day. <laughs> this is a kind of Swedish, you know, encouraging words I heard <laughs> as a child. Oh, that's why we have time, huh? Which is a good point, I suppose. I was not sure whether I should be intimidated by coming here or not. I, uh, I do. Uh, I don't like to go out in public much, so I do three, three perform performances, appearances a year, mostly to pay for my uh, uh, guide fees of uh, fishing because I can't wade certain rivers anymore. I couldn't even earlier, you know. Uh, I was always a little upset. My father was an agronomist, a county agent, a designer of uh, watersheds to be restored, depleted watersheds. The first thing I remember that way, the first funeral, is uh, his secretary's husband drowned in the Pine River when he was swept under a, uh, uh, a log jam, you know. Certainly happens in the Yellowstone, too. So I was, I was a little nervous about waiting. But the idea of going out in public and therefore affording a cut rate guide 60 days of fishing a year seems to be <laughs> worth the trade. <laughs> I'm a little leery of uh, these kind of uh, appearances because I remember in my scant two years in academic life. This was at Stony Brook State University system in New York when it was a fancy place back in the 60s. I remember going to an academic senate meeting and uh, thinking, and we had a lot of brilliant people there, you know, a half a dozen Nobel laureates. It was a little miniature Berkeley in the East. But I realized after two hours of an academic Senate meeting, nothing that was said was causally related to any reality I knew outside the <laughs> academic Senate. Because this was the 60s, and I was getting uh, called by the president of the university even during my naps, which my wife would not wake me up from because I needed to write in the evening so she would be able to tell the president of the university, he's sleeping now. <laughs> but anyway, he'd say, your students are causing problems. But I had a functional sort of low-class knowledge so that when my students took over the administration building, the dean and the president got me over there. I said, this is easy. We go over to the power plant and turn off the heat. <laughs> and we turn off the phone service, too, so they can't call their friends in France or Germany. So it's winter, and we'll just freeze them out. And they looked at me, how astonishing. <laughs> I was thinking today on the way to the airport, I don't have anything to offer you except more questions. But all environmental issues reminded me somehow as a paradigm of a severely compromised marriage where you have to stay together for your not with, for the sake of your nine children who are all mentally and physically ill. 
I know this is not very encouraging, <laughs> but this is, this is how it happens, not just in the West and the East. And then I was recalling <clears throat> what the legal profession could do for you. And I became sort of a fan because uh, I had this situation in northern Michigan where the county, with the permission of the Department of Natural Resources, usually, you know, as you know, the government is often the, the malefactor, to put it mildly. Anyway, they were going to dredge this beautiful channel between two lakes, which were the spawning beds of of uh, brown trout and uh, whitefish and so on. It was a large, long estuarine area, and they needed to dredge it, they said, so boats could comfortably pass between these two rather pristine lakes. So uh, I sued to stop this uh, dredging, and I thought, I have some ill-got gains from Hollywood at this period of my life. You know, I mean, some bucks. So what I did, at the advice of a friend who is an environmental lawyer who stopped them from dumping taconite tailings into Lake Superior, real sharp guy, Jim Olsa, he says, you know, it's going to be a tough one. So here's what we did. We dedicated some uh, funds, as I say, y'all got gains from Warner Brothers, and hired to the right-wing law firm in town, the rich people's law firm. Well, it was their first environmental case ever, ever. <laughs> and they thought, since I got my picture in the paper and they knew they were going to get their money, why not? So we won. So thus we saved the estuarine area. And the singular satisfaction of the whole case, you'll be amused by, is that I was abused in the newspapers and I thought by the County Board of Commissioners. And what was fun is to write a letter to the newspaper saying, I can legally recover my fees from the county, my legal fees, which are considerable. And if one of these bum ones say one more thing, you're going to have to cough up 50 grand. So nobody said anything again. <laughs> so I won. I think about all in terms of love amongst the ruins. You know, what, what do we have left? What, I ha what do we have left that we want to speak, pay special attention to because we have to concentrate our energies? And I talked to, uh, I'd gotten a note from Jan Nystro saying that, you know, don't talk about your work and food. And I thought, well, <laughs> we're on the cook. That sort of nature. We're nature too, as even Shakespeare said, we're nature too. And I thought too, there is an environmental aspect to this uh, 37 course lunch I had in France last fall. <laughs> it took 12 hours, 19 wines. You know, it was something well deserved, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> The environmental aspect is that I seriously thought in the morning, are the 12 of us trying the sewage system of this little French village? <laughs> are we perhaps pushing into the limits? Okay. Uh, eating is natural. I was doing, uh, there's a, uh, Michael Ondaatje is a fantastic uh, Canadian novelist, has a magazine that I write through, uh, write for, uh, for this reason. Uh, when I said, it's obvious to all Americans, it's altogether natural to eat yourself to death. It must be natural because we're doing it. And I says, it takes us time, like, 
It took ancient man, perhaps centuries, not to learn, to learn not to eat blue meat because there were no survivors. <laughs> I even tried it myself in Africa and was quite ill. But what I thought I would uh, talk about is my own exposure and the questions that arose. Uh, I'll read a poem called Walking, as this is an example of where I lived and grew up thinking that the world was like this. The world was like this. Walking back on a chill morning past Kilmer's Lake into the first broad galley, down its trough and over a ridge of poplar scrub oak and into a larger gully, Walking into the slow, fresh warmth of mid-morning to Spider Lake, where I drank at a small spring remembered from ten years back. Walking northwest two miles where another gully opened, seeing a stump on a knoll where my father stood one deer season, and tiring of sleet and cold burned a pine stump, the snow gathering fire orange on a dull day. Walking past charred stumps blackened by the 1881 fire to a great hollow stump near a basswood swale, I sat within it on a November morning watching deer browse beyond my young range of shotgun and slug, chest beating hard for killing. Into the edge of a swale waist high with ferns, seeing the quick movement of a blue racer and thick curl of the snake against the birch log, a pale blue with nothing of the sky in it, a f fleshy blue, blue of knotted veins and an arm, walking to Savage's Lake where I ate my bread and cheese, drank cool lake water and slept for a while, dreaming of fire, snake and fish and women in white linen walking, pinkish warm limbs beneath white linen, then walking, waking, homeward toward Wells Lake, brain at boil now with the heat, afternoon glistening in yellow heat, dead dun brown grass, windless with all distant things shimmering, grasshoppers, birds dull to quietness, walking a log road near a cedar swamp, looking cool with green darkness and whining mosquitoes, mosquitoes, crows call overhead, Cooper's hawk floating singly in mateless haze, walking dumbly foot sore, cutting into evening through sumac and blackberry brambles, onto the lake road, feed sliding in gravel, whippoorwills, nightbirds wakening, stumbling to the lake shore, shedding clothes on sweet moss, walking into syrupy August, moonless dark, water cold, pushing lily pads aside, walking out into the lake with feet springing on mucky bottom until the water flows overhead, sinking again to walk on the bottom, then buoyed up walking on the surface, moving through beds of reeds, snakes and frogs moving to the far edge of the lake, then walking upward over the basswood and elders, the field of sharp stubble and hay bales toward the woods, floating over the bushy crests of hardwoods and tips of pine, barely touching in miles of heavy rolling dark, coming to a larger water there, walking along the troughs of waves, folding in upon themselves, walking to an island, small, narrow, sandy, sparsely wooded, wooded in the middle of the island in the clump of cedars, a small spring which I enter, sliding far down into a deep, cool, dark, endless weight of water. An artist doesn't have to be rational like a lawyer, huh? <laughs> Walking. You know, my, my problem often with younger people and some older thing, how are you going to know about wilderness unless you're completely familiar with the 40-acre woodlot? What is always the point, you know? 
And I'm wondering about the level of my own anger and the quality of my own anger. I once wrote a piece for a Minnesota magazine thinking it was well-reasoned, and they retitled it Jim Harrison Rants. <laughs> you know? And I'm wondering about the quality of the anger, my own anger, that maybe it's connected to Scotland's uh, or Slotkin's wonderful treatise on the tradition of violence in America. For instance, I like in Arizona to drive up, and it's three hours out of the way of everything, to the east end, not the fashionable west end of the Air Viper Canyon. And I got up there the other day, and it's a federal wilderness area, and no one's up there to speak of. I mean, I've been in there any number of times and seen no one. This gorgeous canyon, the two creeks conjoining, and an improbable amount of bird life. Well, this time a rancher had locked a gate so you couldn't get in there, you know. And I'm trying to temper my own self because I have a big chain in uh, my car for that purpose of, of called it's the gate jerking chain, you know. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, calm down, you know. Because I saw at its source a kind of contentiousness that's not doing anything in the West a kind of irrational uh, anger and a desire to be right at all costs. I think of what the Craigheads told McGuane in the old days of Montana, they could get on every ranch in Montana to do their golden eagle count, and now, now about half of them, they're not welcome because of the general level of contentiousness, contentiousness and everyone wanting to be right. You know, what can I do? Not much. Uh, I recall a, a studio head, actually the current chairman of Sony calling me one day and <laughs> screaming over the phone, you're just a writer. You're just a writer. And I thought I'd put that um, up over my desk just to remind myself I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> I'm not anything else, I'm just a writer, and whatever I have to offer will come in the focus of my fiction or my poetry, and won't come through the grace of my ranting, which is singularly ungifted. <laughs> I mean, uh, I once, on the first Earth Day 40 years ago, did a speech at a university where I encouraged all the students to go out and cut down illegal road signs, right? So then I went blithely home, and then I could read in the paper 19 students arrested for cutting down <laughs> road signs, you know? And I was quite comfortable. <laughs> uh, here's one. The other day, here's a, you get in extremis at times. I got a tally counter. You know how people count cows, keep track of what they got? Because I was uh, a little out of shape during different, due to different pressures, and I got this tally counter, and I was just keeping track of how many birds of different varieties I saw, sort of my own personal phonology. And I recalled, and I thought you might enjoy, I wrote a poem quite a while ago called Counting Birds. As a child fresh out of the hospital with tape covering the left side of my face, I began to count birds. At age 50, the sum total is precise and astonishing, my only secret. Some men count women, or the cars they've owned, their shirts, long sleeve and short sleeve, or shoes, but I have my birds, excluding, of course, 
those extraordinary days, the 21,000 snow geese and sandhill cranes at the Bosque del Apache, the sky blinded by great frigate birds in the Pacific off Anconcito, Ecuador, the 21,000 pink flamingos in Gordon Goro Crater in Tanzania, the vast flock of seabirds on the Seri coast of the Sea of Cortez down in Sonora that left at nightfall then reappeared resuming their exact positions at dawn. The 1,000 cliff swallows nesting in the sand cliffs of Pyramid Point, their small round burrows like eyes, really the souls of the Anasazi who flew here a thousand years ago to await the coming of the Manitou. And then there were the usual almost deadly birds of the soul, the crow with silver harness, harness I rode one night as if she were a black feathered angel, the birds I became to escape unfortunate circumstances, how the skin ached as the feathers shot out toward light. The thousand birds, the dogs helped me shoot to become a bird, grouse, woodcock, duck, dove, snipe, pheasant, prairie chicken. On my deathbed, I'll write this secret number on a slip of paper and pass it to my wife and two daughters. It will be a hot evening in late June, and they might be glancing out the window at the thunderstorm's approach from the west. Looking past their eyes and the dead fly on the window screen, I'll wonder if there's a bird waiting for me in the onrushing clouds. Oh, birds, I'll sing to myself, you carried me along on this bloody voyage. Carry me now into that cloud, into the marvel of this final night. More questions. I was in Paris the last November, and I got a call from my wife from Montana. And I thought, this is odd. Why is she calling? Because it's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning at our time. And she thought I'd be interested, and she said, well, uh, the wolves just killed three more of Bob Weber's sheep right under our bedroom window. I can hear them eating the sheep, and our dog Mary is hiding under the covers because <laughs> this is a <laughs> muy malo odor, odor, you know? <laughs> And I was remembering when she said that at my cabin in the UP, where the closest livestock is 100 miles away, because so nothing is a problem up there, that when my dogs would hear a coyote, you know, it was nothing. You know, they bark out the window. But the first time they heard a, a, a wolf close by, right from the river delta right below me, maybe 50 yards from the cabin. Uh, they very slowly, all three of them, filed upstairs and hid under the bed. <laughs> Sound this is, this is not, this is something in genetic memory. So I thought, God, what is the problem here? Because one gets fearful of uh, social engineering. Why did they have to eat three more of Bob Weber's sheep, which means a total of 33 that they've eaten? Now, it's painful when there's so many qualifying measures here. Everything breaks through everyone's sentiment about being right and wrong. Number one, they evidently were forced out of the, the lone bear group were forced out of the Lamar pack the year before, you know, when the pack got too big. But seven of, I think, the nine that finally had to be destroyed had mange. This is interesting. It's November. In fact, the morning I left for Paris, it was eight below. So. In other words, the truth, the actuality of the matter wasn't very reassuring to 
the pro-wolf or anti-wolf forces in Yellowstone Valley. Nothing was clear-cut. Well, if I had mange and lost my fur, the first thing I would do is jump a sheep, you know? <laughs> I mean, anybody would. So, now what, do we, now what do we do with this confusing truth? Then I got irked at this people, at this people from Bozeman saying, well, we're paying for Bob's sheep. And then I realized they don't know that uh, sheep aren't generic any more than cows or people aren't generic. Bob's had this, uh, bred this, this line of sheep for 50 years. You can't buy seven more sheep to go with his sheep. This isn't the way sheep are, you know. So that was the problem. As were the young people that came over and tied 10,000 unsuccessful red ribbons on his fence, which they assured would keep the wolves away. <laughs> no. So we're thinking about, and this guy's 80. So the federal government finally told this 80-year-old man he could shoot the wolves if they ate any more sheep, you know? Which is not too easy on Bob, you know, because he doesn't see too good, as he said. <laughs> so, what I'm saying, the easy answers aren't there. I don't think necessarily it'll be repeated, and I just can't. Uh, here I am in the middle, because I wrote my first novel, Wolf, and the six days that I supported this, this adventure. Of course, they came back in Michigan of their own their own accord out of Minnesota and Wisconsin, and then most of them obviously in the eastern UP came out of uh, across Botswana Bay to Paradise Point. They crossed the, the ice and from Canada, which is a mere 30 miles, and uh, I was seeing them and hearing them regularly for 10 years before the Department of Natural Resources would accept them as existing. So what to do? Now, since I don't have to be rational and I don't have a law degree, I can do, I have other extreme measures I can talk about. Uh, I had this idea that we got to preempt Carl Rovey and the Christian right, so I founded uh, an organization in which, so far as I know, I'm the only member, and I've talked to ranchers about this organization. I'm the president or the chairman of the Christian environmentalists. <laughs> and so they'd say, what's that? <laughs> and I said, well, to me, the earth, the earth is the, the living expression of the Holy Spirit. And, and to the extent that we defile the earth, we defile the Holy Spirit. And the uh, people uh, in Washington uh, that allow this defiling of the Holy Spirit are, are the spawn of Satan. <laughs> so, the sharp ones know immediately I've done a little end run. <laughs> You know, they could see this happening. So, to get them. And then I was utterly startled the other day in the newspaper that I don't know uh, what's happening, in, but there's a group of evangelical ministers that have formed that are, are very concerned with global warning. I don't, warming, I don't know if this is a sign of the future, but it was was fascinating. It's the first sign of this kind of thing I'd say. But anyone that wants to be a member of the Christian environmentalist, because it's a lot of fun, all you have to do is take a penny and throw it in a lake somewhere, and then you're a member. <laughs> what you have in Utah is not different than what you had in Michigan and other places, and I want to address this. 
on the same love amongst the ruins. This true north I wrote was published last summer. I was out in an area of, uh, this is a long time ago, I usually think of my novels and let them brood around for about 15 years, with a poet, Dan Gerber, and we were on the Kingston Plains in the Upper Peninsula where you see a much photographed uh, area of, uh, of about 20,000 acres of white pine stumps. And the white, the big stumps survived because, of course, the plains are aerated, so they didn't rot like much does in the Michigan forest. So Daniel, whose uh, family made baby food, which is relatively benign, he says, I'm sure, my, I'm glad my grandpa did didn't do this, you know. You know, you look at these stumps and you realize that with the, in the Hartwick Pines and the McCormick Track, there may be a couple hundred acres of virgin timber left and everything else was cut. Seven million acres of virgin lumber, timber was cut, every bit of it, mind you. Nothing was missed. Oh, you see in a steep gorge is a stray tree alive. So I started thinking about this novel. What, what if you were a young man of conscience and you realized that uh, it was your family that led the charge on this, that your own predatory family beginning with your great-grandfather but once I researched it, I wasn't totally surprised, but a little bit to see, as I had thought of and suggested at a Wyoming conference that Terry Tempest Williams had 15 years ago when no one ever wanted to talk about it, that there really is a theocracy behind uh, land rape. It's again what Elaine Pagels talks about, the dark side of Christianity, you know, to start wars, to take everything you want in the name of uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because I've come upon these passages in my research, the journals of the first timberman, wonderful passages like, with God's help, with the Almighty's help, I'll cut that 30,000 acres before Ralph Felch gets here, you know, another timber. Isn't this amazing? And Ralph Felch, in fact, was a predator too, and he named the joining towns one Ralph and one Felch, you know. <laughs> but this, there's no limit to this kind of theocratic, feeling that uh, many of our forefathers had for their uh, worst designs of greed, which we might wonder if greed and venality aren't the dominant energies of our time. Well, they were in the 19th century, too. So anyway, I have a young man dealing with his ancestors. What's left? What's left? And I have him getting lost, which is infinitely possible in the UP, because unlike out west here, you can never see where you're going, or very rarely. You know, you can climb a tree, and from the top of that tree, you can see the tops of other trees. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have this marvelous help of elevation, you know. Although still people get lost out here. It's interesting how it's possible. But anyway, uh, his uh, pup runs off. But here's an example of this young man and what happened to uh, him. I'd been in a tent of one and I awoke. I wasn't sure in what direction the cabin lay. I'd always been careful about directions when trout fishing in near wilderness because there was always the possibility of becoming fatally lost in the upper peninsula, though this mostly happened during an especially cold deer season in November, where just snowmobilers ran out of gas. 
I wasn't fearful when I struck out in what turned out to be the wrong direction, but I knew there could be the possibility of discomfort. My jacket with the compass was back at the cabin, and I had only a jackknife and no matches. Even my pocket watch was in the jacket pocket. You can keep a fairly steady heading with a watch if the sun is visible. It was a coolish June mid-morning, but I had a good 12 hours of daylight in front of me at this latitude. I looked in vain in the immediate area for any ferns I may have broken when I came to retrieve Carla, his dog, his pup ran off. The biggest problem for those lost in the Upper Peninsula is the density of the foliage in some areas. You are literally without a point of view except that offered by the sun, which you must remember is moving. After an hour to become unpleasant, my bug dope was also back at the cabin in my jacket pocket. Carla, his pup, was tired, so I had to carry her. She couldn't have weighed more than 20 pounds, but she was ungainly. She may also sense my worry and wiggled a lot. I couldn't seem to get out of a low bog area, which made the mosquitoes and black flies worse. I put Carla down and climbed a pine tree for a vantage point, and she wept, thinking I had abandoned her. I couldn't get high enough to see above the tops of neighboring trees. I tried to maintain a straight line north, knowing that there was a county road within a half dozen miles. At the beginning, I had tried to move too swiftly, and that made me thirsty and my bad ankle sore. I finally broke through to a clearing of about 20 acres. I was so relieved to escape the claustrophobic density of the woods that my eyes teared and I flopped down against the stump. Carla was also relieved and fell fast asleep. After a few minutes, my worried mind and eyes cleared to the degree that I could see that I was sitting on the edge of the grandest collection of white pine stumps I had ever seen. They were simply immense, with several so large that three men with hands drawing couldn't have encircled them. I had inadvertently discovered a shrimp a stump shrine. I counted 30. The soil must have been perfect for white pine, and one could only imagine them rising a couple hundred feet toward the sky. My skin tingled, though my heart and mind felt sore. After a half hour's rest, I picked up Carla, who consented after walking a mere 50 yards or so. On the far side of the clearing, there was a gully that seemed to lead in a more westerly direction. I knew that the sun was furthest north at this, this close to the solstice, and the gully pointed toward downward drainage, so that it had finally to lead toward a creek or the river from which I had departed. I turned around, stood there a full 10 minutes, my innervation and fatigue now gone, until I could imagine again what this patch of forest had looked like. I can't say how, but the massive stumps now seemed alive and reassured me that my work had a great deal of meaning. My ankle still hurt, but the ache seemed as insignificant as a mosquito bite. Scarcely a hundred yards down the slow pitch of the gully, I came upon a stunning surprise. There before me was the largest of all white pine stumps, the great mother of stumps straddling the gully like a 10-ton spider, supported by roots so massive I couldn't get my arms around the roots. I had put Carla down. She had scurried around to the other side, sniffing the ground. Suddenly, she was inside the stump, and I was looking down at her through an opening between two contorted roots. There was a slice of sunlight shining down on her face, and she regarded me gravely. I scrambled around to the other side, and there was an opening large enough to crawl in, and I joined Carla. It was sufficiently high enough for me to set up straight and there was light to see the ground, which was a mixture of cool, cool sand and gravel. 
Carla was shivering in fear, but I knew it was the scats on the ground left probably by a bobcat and coyotes and a larger piece of dried fecal matter that was likely from a bear. I was enthralled, and there was a distinct feeling similar to when I had been baptized. I thought that this was as close as I could to come to finding a church for myself in our time. So love amongst the ruins. Where do we turn for help? That's the question. It occurred to me in the last election, how much can be extrapolated? I was thinking if Bush is most familiar with Midland, you know, and Bar Harbor, and Kerry is Bostonian who goes to France, where does that leave us? I'm not sure. <laughs> As our xenophobia is so deep, you can't extrapolate one part of the country from another. I was shocked when a uh, uh, Senate Republican came to Nogales the other day because that's the first national politician I know that's actually come down to look at the border other than our local things. No one had ever been there. They keep saying we're going to stop border crossings, which is comic if you live there. And I greet the people walking down my, my creek uh, gully. I said, you know, all uh, stuff like that. And they ask me, they're from Chiapas, and they say, where is Chicago? <laughs> and, uh, who's stopping who? 600,000 successfully crossed. And the only measure that works, of course, is if you'd make those that hired them responsible. But this is slave labor. This is minimum wage, five bucks and 15 cents an hour. You know, nobody wants it. Stop. Does it cripple us? Here's another question. Does it cripple us to know what we know? In the Upper Peninsula, the trouble with knowledge. I'm my parents' child. My mother is really a profound amateur naturalist that literally knew hundreds of birds just from their calls. She had cataracts a long time. Any American warbler, any bird, you know, in those foggy old eyes, she could tell you what it was. She could tell you any weed by its odor, that kind of thing. My father and agronomist, too. And their son, an often profligate, misbehaved poet. But I did inherit something of them. But what did we know? I read the account of Louis Agassiz to the Upper Peninsula in the 1850s, you know, before anything happened. And you know, when he got back to Cambridge, <coughs> Longfellow, of course, read his account and uh, wrote that foul piece of dog roll called Hiawatha. <laughs> <laughs> but I read this account of Agassiz on the Douglas Houghton expedition, and I realized, of course, nothing that you see, this is true of Utah, is as it was. It can still be beautiful, but everybody would say in front of my cabin, I stopped correcting them, what a beautiful river, because it was a beautiful river, but I also know it had been mortally gouged by the passage of logs down the river and could never be recovered. That's just like you say on the Empire Ranch at BLM property of 100,000 that I've hunted. It's been so overgrazed on the hills that all the soil has descended to the bottoms. And so someone would say, well, uh, this can recover. I said, no, it can't. Can't ever recover. This is a mortal wound. How are you gonna, you're gonna take all the soil from the bottom and sprinkle it on top or what? And I don't. 
I'm not a kvetch about it, but I do know that uh, you don't tell over grazing sideways, you tell it by looking straight down. And when I say a, gore, a gully that you could bury a dozen D9 cats in, I know that maybe possibly this has been overgrazed. <laughs> if you want to hide any bulldozers. But what do I know up to a point? I think uh, in my concluding minutes, I'm going to say what I do know, which is uh, my poetry. In my poetry, and I was thinking again, uh, Paige knows this curious thing that nobody wanted to think about when you're in your cynical 20s and you think you're an existentialist, whatever that is. It's a hope to meet girls in black turtlenecks or something. I never <laughs> figured out. When Yeats said, what portion of the world can the artist have who is awakened from the common dream but dissipation and despair, which is an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. I teased Richard Ford, who's a friend, about Rock Springs. I said, I never met anyone in the West that was that dumb. <laughs> you know, some of the dialogue. You know, we do, writers will tend to create dialogue that would bore a Ford mechanic to prove a point, you know, <laughs> where the language is actually a little more interesting than that. I can only cover so much. I've got 10 minutes left. I was going to read a few poems. The first one, very old poem, when I thought of this natural world. The earth is almost round. The seas are curved that hug the earth. Both ends are crowned with ice. The great blue whale swims near the sights. His heart is warm and weighs 2,000 pounds. His tongue weighs twice as much. He weighs 150 tons. There's so few of them left, he often can't find a mate. He drags his foot, six foot six through icy waters. Flukes spread crashing. His brain is large enough for a man to sleep in. Uh, I entered after living on a river. You know, I was struck because I was a little crazy at the time, 25 years ago, with uh, the usual signs of our time, drugs and alcohol and so on. When I bought this cabin next to a river, and I knew somewhere I'd read that in India, if they want to deal with a crazy person, they tie him to a tree beside a river for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Which sort of does the job. <laughs> and I, anyway, after 25 years of hearing a river, even on my creek at uh, Patagonia, I had uh, my grandsons uh, build a dam of 500 rocks, a waterfall, so I could hear the river at night. You know, you hear that pitch. Because it's, uh, Yates kept talking about the dance is a metaphor. But I think the river, the river comes closer, water, the old Taoist notion. And I'd written then, consequently, a book of poems called The Theory and Practice of Rivers. Even reading a whole book on hydrology, which was tough for a poet. What happens? Let's have a few minutes of poems concluding. Looking forward to age. Looking forward to age. I will walk down to a marina on a hot day and not go out to sea. I will go to bed and get up early and carry too much cash in my wallet. On Memorial Day, I will visit the graves of all those who died in my novels. If I have become famous, I'll wear a green janitor suit and row a wooden boat. 
From a key ring on my belt will hang 33 keys that open no doors. Perhaps I'll take my grandchildren to Disneyland in the camper, but probably not. <laughs> One day standing in the river with my fly rod, I'll have the courage to admit my life. In a one-room cabin at night, I'll consign photos, alternative memories to the fire. And you, my loves, few as there have been, let's lie and say it could never have been otherwise, so that we may glide off in peace, not howling like orphans in this endless century of war. Bears. I told McGuane when I finally, we had agreed both to move to Montana in 68, but I was tardy. We were fishing when we agreed this, and uh, I told them, please, Tom, when I do finally get this place out west, tell me that I won't have to hear those key Midwestern words, healing enclosure. <laughs> and he says, no, out here, you will hear sustainable, and you must pick your megafauna. And I said, how about coyote? No, 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 no. How about the normal black bear, which I'm so familiar with? The last time I got environmentally violent was when a, uh, uh, a dentist shot a black bear on my property that weighed just short of 600 pounds. And I'd been so used to this black bear for years that uh, I know you're not supposed to make them pets, but I would leave them fish once in a while, and we'd chat about things. <laughs> like Glenn Larson, who used to be able to, on the Quetico Superior, he would put the tracking collars on bear. They would come up. And he would say hello and put them on. The only time I know that he'd give him a donut and put the collar on. <laughs> but he was uh, one of those Scandinavian loonies after 40 years in the woods. The bears thought he was related or something. <laughs> but this bear would rest its chin on my car. His head would fall up the window. And I don't know what he thought we were talking about. So. <laughs> I got a little out of hand when he went to heaven, you know. Wrote a little poem about him. It's goofy and adolescent and enraged, so I'll read it anyway. <laughs> Down in the bone mess of the cellar of this farmhouse behind the empty fruit jars, the whole wall swings open to the room where I keep the bear. There's a tunnel to the outside on the far wall that emerges in the lilac grove in the backyard, but she rarely uses it, knowing there's no room around here for a freewheeling bear. She's not a dainty eater, so once a day I shovel shit while she lopes in playful circles. Privately, she likes religion. From the bedroom, I hear her incantatory moans and howls below me. In April 23rd, when I open the car trunk and whistle at midnight, and she shoots up the tunnel almost airborne when she meets the night. We head north, and her growls are less friendly as she scents the forest above the road smell. I release her where I found her as an orphan three years ago, bawling against the dead carcass of her mother. I let her go at the head of the gully leading down to the swamp, jumping free of her snarls and roars. But each October 9th, one day before bear season, she reappears at the cabin, frightening the bird dogs. We embrace ear to ear, her huge head on my shoulder, her breathing like gods. I was down, down in the Yucatan with a guy who he even speaks Mayan. He's been down there 35 years. Another goofy Scandinavian from Minnesota and speaks fluent Mayan. And <coughs> we were at this compound. And the Mayans in this jungle compound have a bunch of uh, 
you know, rather aggressive dogs because they think the Mexicans are stealing from them, which is in fact true sometimes, okay? And, uh, and uh, I got a little way with dogs and after a few minutes, the guard dogs all had their heads on my lap. Uh, this uh, old mine elder who has his legs cut off from diabetes, he says to me, uh, He's serious. He says, are you part dog? And I said, just a little bit. <laughs> Two generations ago, this guy has a wonderful sense of humor. They drove him to a clinic for his diabetes, and he doesn't have any legs. So they set him out in the yard, and he slumped over under some bushes, and he was there a day and a half before anyone remembered he was out there. And he thinks this is a funny thing. <laughs> the way white people do things. Can you imagine such a thing? All my life, I've held myself at a non-disclosed location. Sometimes I have a roof over my head, but no floor, and sometimes a floor, but no roof. This is the song of a man who wrote songs without music. Dog songs, river songs, bear songs, bird songs, though they didn't need my help. And many people's songs. The just waking universe returned the favor with spherical carols as if creation hadn't stopped a minute which it hadn't, as if our songs helped it become itself. We gave no voice to the bear, but watched our minds allow the bear to become a bear. At a brief still point on the whirling earth, we saw both the stars and the ground we walked upon, struggling to recognize each other at noon, talked ourselves deaf and blind on the sharp edge of disappearing for reasons we never figured out. I was conceived near a dance hall on a bend of a river, now, 67 years downstream, I'm singing a water song, not struggling against the ungentle current. And then a final poem. This is a poem uh, I wrote when uh, I was in France, partly. I was supposed to be doing a thing about <coughs> literary xenophobia essay for the New York Times. And I said, who is fooling myself? I, I couldn't write essays like this as a graduate student. What the hell am I doing now? So I wrote this poem instead, and they were kind enough to publish it. Uh, it's a matter of levels of discourse. Some people are good at different levels of discourse. And, I couldn't do what they wanted. But you all remember, some of you, the old days. In the old days, it stayed light until midnight, and rain and snow came up from the ground rather than down from the sky. Women were easy. Every time you'd see one, two more would appear, walking toward you backwards as their clothes dropped. <laughs> Money didn't grow on the leaves of trees, but around the trunks in calves' leather money belts, though you could only take 20 bucks a day. Certain men flew as well as crows, while others ran up trees like chipmunks. Seven Nebraska women were clocked swimming upstream in the Missouri faster than the local spotted dolphins. Basenjis could talk Spanish, but all of them chose not to. A few political leaders were executed for betraying the public trust, and poets were rationed a gallon of burgundy a day. <laughs> People only died in one day a year, and lovely choruses funneled out of hospital chimneys where every room had a field stone fireplace. Some fishermen learned to walk on water, and as a boy I trotted down rivers, my fly rod as to ready. Women who wanted love need only to wear pig's ear slippers or garlic earrings. All dogs and people in free concourse became medium-sized and brown, and on Christmas, everyone won the $100 lottery. 
God and Jesus didn't need to come down to earth because they were already here riding wild horses every night and children were allowed to stay up late to hear them galloping by. This one's a far reach. The best restaurants were churches with Episcopalians serving Provençal, the Methodist, Tuscan, and so on. <laughs> in those days, the country was an extra 2,000 miles wider and an additional 1,000 miles deep. There were many undiscovered valleys to walk in where Indian tribes lived undisturbed, though some tribes chose to found new nations into the heretofore unknown areas between the black boundary cracks between states. I was married to a Pawnee girl in a ceremony behind the usual waterfall. Courts were manned by sleeping bears and birds sang lucid tales of ancient bird ancestors who now fly in other worlds. Certain rivers ran too fast to be usable, but were allowed to do so when they consented not to flood at the Des Moines Conference. Airliners were similar to airborne ships with multiple fluttering wings that played a kind of chamber music in the sky. Pistol barrels grew delphiniums, and everyone was able to select seven days a year. They were free to repeat, but this wasn't a popular program. <laughs> In those days, the void world with flowers and unknown wild animals attended country funerals. All the rooftops and cities were flower and vegetable gardens. The Hudson River was drinkable, and a humpback whale was near, seen near the 42nd Street Pier, its head full of the blue blood of the sea, its voice lifting the steps of people in their traditional anti-march, their harmless dis disarray. I could go on, but won't. All my evidence was lost in the fire but not before it was chewed down by all the dogs that inhabit memory. One by one, they bark at the sun, moon, and the stars, trying to draw them closer again. Thank you. Maybe they know everything. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> oh, I was putting my scarf on. <laughs> <laughs> Will greed go away? Well, greed, no, of course not. Why not? It's the human feel. I get more, you get less. And I don't even know if I got more unless you have less. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the funny thing. Uh, Doug Wick, a producer I worked with, knew the Reagans really well. And Nancy was always brooding about the cost of her uh, Nicaraguan dishwasher and stuff. You know, I mean, it's impossible. I don't know. You know that biblical sense of greed. I love this one in the Old Testament. There once was a rich man that owned three horses, two camels, and a granary full of grain. That was a rich guy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. But what's enough? Nobody ever seems to know what's enough. You know, will greed go away? I think <coughs> not. You gonna write about that Indians more? What? Oh, uh, uh, brown dog. Yeah, I finished another brown dog that's coming out in September. I said once to a mind doctor who was trying to help me, and I said, uh, I said, well, he was talking about my work. And I, I, I said, well, brown dog is my alter ego. And he says, no, it's closer than that. <laughs> <laughs> you know that wonderful feeling you had when you were 22 and you had a uh, cup pulp or something, you had $8, so you could have something to eat and eight beers, then you'd fall asleep and do it all over again. <laughs> and sometimes you would find love. That was a different kind of existence. 
that was the case of enough. That the, who was uh, John Kenneth Galbraith said that famous thing, economics. Uh, the difference in not having enough and having enough is enormous. The difference between having enough and wanting too much is a whole, a whole other area in question. You know, I don't know what to think about it because I'm not. I found out through the pursuit of the IRS, I wasn't economically gifted. <laughs> I was the laying sphinx of American literature. For, when, I first, when I first made some money, I had no idea because no one in the history of my family had ever made any <laughs> money, nor were they particularly interested in the idea. They were sort of altruists. Yeah. Yes?